patients to one nurse and there's no emergency care, that is a glorious day. That's good. I'm going to be busy, but I'm going to get my stuff done. Five patients to one nurse, it's, I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to need a cold one at the end of the day to get through. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, now, it sounds like you've got some hardened uh, nerves over there to hit, to hit with yeah, a 10 to 1. Keep going, get it. You can double. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> and it's also, unfortunately, especially in the medical community, where everybody's been used to just being overworked. And so, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, 32 patients that you're used to? I'm used to 35 patients top. Yeah. And I've done it. As a school teacher, I'm like, mm -hmm. I have a classroom with 30 kids. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Unions are like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would love to see 12 kids. I actually have one class with nine kids this year, and it's been glorious. We've had the best year. And then the eighth period, my last period of the day, I have 28 kids. And it is just exhausting. It is the, oh, my gosh. We get stuff done. Yeah. But, but it's I exhausted. Uh, Even for no, no, students, no. it's like that. It's awful. Five to one is a busy day. Ten to one, you're risking mistakes. You're 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 risking quite a bit at ten to one. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's tough. You can do it, but it's tough. Mm -hmm. um, anything above that, though, and the unions getting called, there are people quitting. It's it's not good. It's not good. At the height of the COVID, COVID pandemic, we saw crisis situations when it came to staffing in uh, nursing homes, specifically in senior centers. Crisis staffing situations. I'm talking 30 to 1. Mm -hmm. People were on the news saying, we've never seen numbers like this before. This is the worst case scenario. This has never happened in the lifetime of the U.S. 30 to 1. And to that I say, oh! Over here in Pennhurst, we saw it towards the height of the situation here in the early 60s. Um, we had ratios of uh, easily 100 to 1. Phew. And so at that ratio, you are, there's nothing you can do. You just lock yourself up in a nursing station, wait for them to tire themselves out, and... and yeah, right? Clean up the aftermath. <laughs> that's but, right. Yeah, that's clean up the that's aftermath. And so if there's anything that you tried to do, uh, most likely you did a half ass attempt at it, or you could not get to the full procedure, and so you're going to have to go back later if you remember. And so this is around the time that we're starting to see some really, really nasty stuff. Uh, neglect run amok, mm -hmm. um, and people who are physically restrained who are not being checked upon uh, with the regulatory 15 minutes, uh, instead being left for hours, and uh, they're harming themselves trying to get out of the restraints because they're humans after all. And so, yeah. But the funny thing is, this neglect is not because of malintent; it's because of self-preservation. Again, these nurses are not going to be able to do anything. These games are not going to be able to do anything. If they don't care, it's because they do care. Um, they want to be there to help, but they have to make really nasty choices, and we put them in that position. Uh, when you get a chance to talk with Madonna and Bernie, I want you to really pay attention to how Bernie tells her story about how she starts her time. Really pay attention to, like, where she's coming from. She's here. Uh, she doesn't explicitly say it, but they immediately, you can immediately sense that there's something wrong with the picture. As she's coming in, and I don't want to like spoil it, but just listen in on uh, on it so you can uh, hear and find it. But they were overworked, and they, they still love the people that work that live there, and it's just a horrible place to be. Nonetheless, all of this was uh, coming to a head in the mid '60s. Uh, people were really complaining. People were, were starting to catch wind of what was going on over here. Uh, so much so that eventually, an up-and-coming journalist by the name of Bill Baldini hears about the goings on over here and asks the staff here, "Hey, can I come in and like bring a camera crew? Can I film here and get this out to the public?" And they said, "Please, <laughs> help! Come in, help me out!" And so he brings in a, a camera crew and films a five-part expose titled "Suffer the Little Children." If you've not heard of this before, I encourage you to check it out. It's not for the squeamish, but it is a five-part expose that uh, aired in Philadelphia television, Suffer the Little Children. It, uh, it's available on YouTube in all five parts. It gets people talking about this facility. This was not hidden away. We knew about this place. We didn't know exactly what was going on until Baldini comes in and shows us. He does put a sensational twist on it. He shows all the negatives, none of the positives, but he gets the conversation going. Other people start catching wind of other places around, and so we get other journalists showing their exposés. The national conversation doesn't start until uh, a, um, 
a journalist by the name of Gerald Riviera comes in and films Willowbrook in New York. He got so famous from it that he actually changed his name and is now still on TV. He's uh, Geraldo Rivera. He filmed Willowbrook and he got national attention and everybody started talking. This place doesn't really get anything done until uh, the 70s when we have a patient by the name of Terry Lee Holderman who uh, receives routine care. She was supposed to receive um, a tooth extraction uh, and the dentist overworked and spread thin, removed the tooth and, um, you know, as quickly as he could and, you know, sends her on her way. She complains to mom that there's still pain at the site of extraction. So the dentist comes in and says, uh, they go for the second opinion and find out that, oh, uh, uh, it, it looks like I might have missed something. Maybe the tooth broke or something. I'll go back in and fish the rest of it out and we'll be fine. So he goes in and starts to pull on this and he realizes, oh, crap, that's not a broken tooth. That's a closed jawbone. I did not close the site properly. Uh, yeah, that's ungodly pain. I can only I have a broken tooth right now, and I can only imagine what she's dealing with. Um, and so, yeah, that was rough. Mom was so furious at the fact that this happened twice, uh, and so she decides to go to legislation. She goes to the Supreme Court and starts to try and get the compensation started. Get this place money. That dentist was overworked and was allowed to make a decision. Uh, excuse me, a bad decision twice. It was not his fault. It's the fact that he was overworked. Get money to pen him. So the judge comes in with fact-finding mission to say, okay, what's exactly going on? Where can I put the money so that we can get this place up and running? And he finds exactly everything we've talked about so far. Free labor, uh, the fact that resources were being procured and they were not receiving anything for it. Um, the fact that people were here against, uh, not even against their will, but without knowing that they have freedoms. He realizes that this place is in ex is that exists here, that has been allowed to exist, is infringing upon the civil rights of, 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 of Americans, and they don't even realize it. This place cannot function as it is. It can't function at all. So the judge orders this place closed. He says no longer can Penhurst function the way it does. The institutionalization must end. And so he orders this place closed in 77. It takes 10 years. They come to an agreement where Penhurst says, we will pay the fine. We're staying open for until we get everybody out of here. Uh, now, other police have closed down and said, all right, you can't live here, so find somewhere else to go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and just sent them on their way. They said, you have your freedoms. Go ahead and exercise them. They don't know anything. They don't know what to do. They've just oh. been allowed to go into this open world. Like, that's not how that works. Penhurst knew that that was going to be a problem, so they actually decided to pay the fine, stay open, and get them into proper care and proper facilities as they're leaving here. So they did not leave, or they did not let anybody go until they knew they had a place to go. Uh, now, they did have their own freedoms, however, so they could choose to take those accommodations, or they could choose to make it out on their own. Again, it's their choice. Uh, what happens after that, though, is on them, unfortunately, because we didn't do anything afterwards to help with intellectual disability. This is where we find ourselves right now. We have solved the crime of institutionalization. However, we have done nothing since then to help with those with disabilities. So this is where I come in, and I'm going to step on my soapbox real quick, and I'm going to give you my closing remarks, and then we can move on to uh, the museum. Um, but I can tell you right now that as a teacher in the public school system, we do a lot to care for those with intellectual disabilities. We do everything we can to make sure that anybody who has a disability is seen as a human being, as an equal in my classroom, and they will receive the proper care needed to have a fighting chance to learn whatever it is that I have to learn. Uh, to teach them. Um, but the second they get out of school, those accommodations dry up very quickly. And in fact, they're almost thrown to the wolves after that. We don't have many accommodations for those with disability, especially if they don't have insurance. So that stuff dries up immediately. As far as intellectual care is concerned, it ends out of the public school system. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do as far as that's concerned. Now, going to the other, the oh, other part of this as well, uh, how can we as a public prevent something like this from happening again? Uh, think about the ugly laws. Think about the fact that we had the police enforcing these ugly laws, that if you acted differently, we don't want you here anymore. Um, I, well, let me have you guys pull, uh, pull up this way a little bit. Looks like we're getting some cars. Um, we don't practice the ugly laws anymore. We don't have police governing how you act on the streets uh, by, by like physical appearance and, and that kind of stuff anymore. We don't really do that anymore. But we still practice the ugly laws in different ways. We still enforce them ourselves. 
uh, accustomed to. And especially if somebody's from outside the country, like who knows what idiosyncrasies they've developed over their time. Maybe opening the door is not a thing they do. It's not even heard of or something like that. I don't know. But the point is, if somebody does something to challenge you and your perspective, don't take it as an offense the first time around. Try to understand their perspective. Try to see where they're coming from. Chances are, they're not really trying to be a jerk. They're just doing their own thing. Let them do their own thing. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get off my soapbox. I'm going to take you inside uh, so we can see the museum. So follow me in. Let's go ahead and uh, put down a bottle of water. You want your water? Oh, geez. Yes, thank you. See, ADHD. There it is again. Thank you. I don't know which one I talked to. Huh? I talked to one of them that I got like an interview, but I don't know. It wasn't the one in the wheelchair. It was the one that was walking, like standing. Oh, you should get that. Do you have my phone? It's in my pocket. This one here. If you want it. It won't read the penhurst, so get the picture of the penhurst date. That's not mine. Well, why'd you grab mine? I want to get the door. Okay, I'll keep walking. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 